Today I want to have a little bit of fun playing around with a characterization that uses an over-the-top, exaggerated version of twang. I find it to be a very productive way of unlocking our voices and our imaginations and producing various types of sounds along the twang continuum. So if we think of twang as having countless possible characters, from very pronounced to very subtle to nasally and to everything in between. And by exploring them fully, we now have more artistic choices on our artist palette. And what you may find with this approach that I'm going to teach you today is it's going to have you belting without your having to think consciously or actively about belting. And that's because it's going to bypass our conscious brains and our guarded psyches and our tone consciousness and it's going to get our voices coordinating in a way that will ultimately help us to create lots of other types of sounds. So I am going to introduce you to a fun little exercise that I like to call invoking our inner Ethel Merman. Now some of you may not know who Ethel Merman was, and for your benefit I'm going to post some clips. I got rhythm, I got music, I got my man who could ask for anything more. I got daisies in green pastures. I got my man who could ask for anything more. There's no business like show business like no business I know. Everything about it is appealing. Everything the traffic will allow. But I I gotta play all the things that I gotta be yet. Come on, Papa, what do you say? Blow a kiss, take a bow. Honey, everything's coming up, roses. I am convinced that there's a little bit of Ethel in all of us. Now, Ethel Merman was known as a powerful belter. She had an incredibly brassy voice with lots of twang in it. But her voice was not known for its beauty. So today, I am going to ask you to invoke your inner Ethel Merman and totally twangify your phrases. And yes, you did just hear me say twangify and use it as a verb, which would probably mortify my former English teachers. Taking a song sung by Ethel, I can try to sound a little bit like her. Now, I have my own natural timbre that isn't anything like hers, that is true, but I can nevertheless attempt to sound a little bit like her, use a little bit of that characterization, a little bit of her same technique. There's no business like show business like no business I know. Doesn't sound anything like me. Let's try an Ethel song together. If you're having difficulties accessing that brassiness in your voice, accessing your inner Ethel Merman, go back to the original experimental twangy sounds that we discussed in my first twang videos, parts 1, 1 1.5, and 2. And what we're going to do is we are going to do this bright twangy wah or la through the melody of the vocal phrase and then immediately reintroduce the lyrics so that we can find that functional coordination and transfer it to the song melody. But our wah is going to be a little bit more Ethel, wah, and a little less baby-like, wah. Don't worry about the aesthetics right now, right? Wow, 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 wow! I got rhythm! Now, I personally would not sing with quite that much brassiness. Even within the same style of musical theater, I would probably dial that down a little bit to suit my own personal timbre a little bit without completely prettying it up. I would still keep a little bit of that brass in there. I got rhythm! I got music! Right? You hear that? It's really just a tamer version of Ethel. So now you're probably wondering, well, if we're just going to dial it down in the end, then why are we going through all of this trouble to make these extreme sounds? Well, again, it comes back to coordination. It comes back to this idea of just sort of bypassing our overdeveloped need to try to control the beauty of our tone and getting the voice to coordinate the way that we need it to coordinate in order to ultimately make the kinds of sounds that we want to make. If we start to think too far ahead, too far to the finished product and the, the final aesthetics, then sometimes we miss that coordination. 
But when we're using this characterization, this over-the-top characterization, we're essentially kind of tricking our bodies into doing what we actually want them to do. In the unlikely event that I were ever cast to play a character whose voice needs to be abrasive and brassy, I would achieve that sound by invoking my inner Ethel Merman. Now imagine, for example, how artistically inappropriate and ineffective it would be for the characters of Monsieur et Madame Thénardier in Les Miserables to sing ever so sweetly, One thing more, one small doubt, there are treacherous people about. No offense, please reflect, your intentions may not be correct. If their words were sincere, if they genuinely cared about Cosette's safety and well-being, it would make perfect sense for them to sing with that kind of sweet quality. But no, they are merely feigning sincerity. These are ugly people. They are liars and cheaters and abusers, and they have some pretty unethical business practices. I mean, I don't even want to know what the this and that is with which they fill up their sausages. Kidney of a horse, liver of a cat, filling up the sausages with this and that. These are ugly characters, and the listener half expects them to have ugly voices, some sort of external representation or manifestation of their ugly, unattractive interiors. And it's all about character building, and this is where this inner Ethel Merman comes into play. So once again, I would bring back these experimental wah Ethel kind of sounds. Wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. One thing more. One small doubt, there are treacherous people about. So you hear that inner Ethel Merman coming out? It really is just Ethel Merman, it's twang. It's not at all close to my natural timbre, but I can make it work safely and fairly effectively, at least from an artistic standpoint, by using my inner Ethel Merman. You can draw out your inner Ethel Merman for other types of characterizations as well. How about your inner nerd? Hello, my name is Elder Grant. It's a book about America a long, long time ago. So really, I just added a little hint of nasality to create that sort of stereotypical nerdy effect. So if we're singing The Last Midnight from Into the Woods, be the witch. Put on your witch's character, draw out your inner Ethel Merman, use your witch's cackle vocal tract setup. It does not have to be a caricature or a stereotype of a witch's voice. <laughs> I'll get you my pretty and your little dog too. Right? But at the same time, we don't want it to sound all sweet and pretty either or sing-songy. In fact, our performance will be even more effective from an artistic point of view if we don't try to sound all sweet and pretty and sing-songy. Sometimes our voices are expected to be all sweet and pretty. Princesses, fairy godmothers, fair maidens, and other protagonists. But sometimes our voices need to get a little ugly. Villains, thieves, witches, wicked stepmothers, and other antagonists. We have to contextualize our singing. So the voice qualities that we create need to reflect the kinds of characters that we're trying to build. And this actually applies to other styles as well. If you are a rock singer, for example, when you set foot on that stage, you are playing the character of a rock singer. It may be who you are on the inside, but your voice is a characterization of your speaking voice. It's not how you speak, unless you speak with a lot of distortion and grit. We have to remember that in musical theater, singing is primarily about furthering the storyline, conveying emotions, communicating that, and building the characters further. So let's go back to The Last Midnight, and again, we're going to sing this with a little bit of our Ethel in us, the wah! Here you want a bean! Have another bean! So see, I added a little bit of growl in there, and quite frankly, that's about as menacing as I can possibly make my own voice sound. So as you're first trying to build that coordination, getting your voice to function and coordinate like you want it to, don't worry so much about how it sounds inside your own head. If it doesn't sound like what you ordinarily associate with beautiful or good singing, take off your judge's robe and put on your mad scientist lab coat. The more you experiment, 
the more you explore, the more colors and textures you're going to discover within your own voice and then later have access to on your artist palette. So give yourself permission to sometimes make some, yes, ugly, brassy, abrasive sounds on your way toward making the sounds that you feel suit your personal aesthetic and the styles in which you sing. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm sure that I probably brought you down some paths that were maybe a little bit surprising and maybe intimidating. It's really all part of the exploration process and it's what artists do. They step outside of their comfort zones and their creative boxes and they ultimately find what works for them. So I hope this really works effectively for you. Please let me know how you do with it. Leave some comments in the comment section below or email me at karen at singwise.com. Message me on the Singwise Vocals Facebook page. I usually post a couple videos a week, so please take a moment to subscribe so that you'll receive a notification the next time I post a video. In the meantime, have a little bit of fun with this. Have a little bit of fun exploring your inner Ethel Merman. Belly chew up a lot